this next presentation, um, I'm going to talk about pieces of words. So we touched on the first presentation. In English, we have words like act, and we add things like ivity to the end of it to get activity, right? They call this derivation in the books. We don't need to know the word, but if you run into it in the book, then you'll know why. And uh, like you, you probably noticed today when we were talking about different words, I tend to try and break them up. And this is what I'm doing. Um, this is what I found is a way for me to try and internalize the pieces. And I can figure out, if I can figure out what pieces go into a word, and I know three of them, then I just have to remember the fourth piece. So that's only maybe one or two syllables. Um, I'm not always successful, as you've seen, but also when I am, I can lock it in and, and I find it as an aid for memory. So <coughs> I'm just going to give a few, uh, kind of a background to some of this for everyone else to see kind of how I go about it. Again, I just come at it as a learner, right? I'm still on this trail like everyone else. We're all trying to figure out how, how we can learn more. Um, and so this is one technique that I've found. And when we do our little presentation on study techniques, I'll show you another way to, or I'll show you several ways to incorporate this into, into uh, daily study. But I just want to show you kind of some of this stuff. I, I didn't understand this when I first started learning and I found it really useful. So I'm going to go over some of the, some very common, what we're, we're going to call morphemes, right? The little pieces of the word. It's all on the handout there that I gave. Um, so I want to just kind of show you some of the morphemes and how they work, and then we can go through that whole booklet there that I've handed out after, um, once I give just a bit of an explanation. So we talked the other day about three types of verbs. One, where I do something, it doesn't affect anyone. Another, so uh, in I see. I'm not blind, I have vision sort of idea, mm -hmm. but I'm not seeing anything in particular. Nuwapaten, I see it, that thing, um, but it's not somebody, right? I'm seeing something, an inanimate thing. And then, Nawapa Mao, I see him or her, the animate object. So we have, the first one I want to show you is Ige. And in TH, this would be Igi. Um, and so I'm just going to give you some example words that we'll talk about. Does anyone know what this word means? To write, right? Nimasnahigan would be I am writing, but yes, this is the root for that. This, this ige part, this, yeah, this is just to say to someone, write, like write something, write things. I'm, I'm going to give you a rough um, idea of what ige means in this context. It kind of means things, but grammatically what it does is it makes it intransitive. You remember the niwapin I just see in general? This is just write something in general. It doesn't say anything specific. So that's what this morpheme is doing here. Because the way we can find this out, if we look at another word, this is the root of another word. So if I conjugate it like this, again, I'm writing in Y dialect here, but we're going to do a presentation on changing it so we can cover that. Nimasinahain, I write it, I write something. Like Nimasinahain, Masnaigan? Yeah, Nimasinahain, Nuihoen. I think I've got that right. Nimasinahain, Nuihoen. I write my name. But in this one, I literally have to specify what I'm writing. But in this one, with the Ige, I'm literally. Just writing in general. I can't say nemas nehigan nuihuen. It just doesn't well, it doesn't work because once I put the ige in there, I can't specify anymore because the the ige kind of takes that portion portion of it. So I'm, if we look at this word, ayamichige. Uh, Does anyone know what that means? To read. To read. To read things because it's got the ige in there. But if you wanted to read a book and specify that you're reading a book, you would actually use ayamita, which is a VTI. It's like, this is the nuwapaten and this is the nuwapin. Like this is the, that's those are the different types of verbs, right? So this one makes it into a verb where you don't specify anything. It's just like a statement. I read in general, 
where this one is like I read something and you have to specify it later on. So as a learner, when I see this IGE, and you'll see me do this, <laughs> we talked about this morning where I'm like constantly like, is there a, is there a this piece in there? And you're kind of like, uh, I'm not really sure because it, it seems weird coming from a different perspective, but from a learner's perspective, I'm sitting there trying to figure out, am I hearing an IGE? Because if it is, then I'll just forget about it because I know IGE is at the end, right? And these, these pieces show up more or less in generally the same positions within words. So IGE is going to be at the end of the word, whereas other, other morphemes are going to show up at the beginning. Um, and just on a, yeah, so, so when I learn these little pieces, and you, and you see fluent speakers when they talk, sometimes they, they chatter back and forth about which pieces they're going to use. It, it's just like an unconscious process, but it, it's actually quite fun because it can be... Uh, you kind of like, oh, that word connects to that one, and that one connects to that one. And it gives kind of a pathway to, to put your memories on, or I found. So here's another one. Wait, binage. To throw things, literally. Throw, in general, throw away. But, but, uh, but you wouldn't say, nuwe pinagan kigwai. Like, you wouldn't specify what you're throwing. It doesn't really sound right, <laughs> right? So you'd use. <laughs> so if we take the igge off of wepinige, we get the root wepin, and that becomes our VTI. So nuepinane, right? Nuepinane, I throw, like nuepinane, masnaigane again, I throw away a paper, but I have. To, I have to use this one if I'm going to specify the paper. If, if I want the verb to relate to an object outside of it, I have to include the, the object in the second one. But as soon as I put the agay in there, I don't have to worry about it because I'm just saying I'm, I'm throwing something away. I'm throwing things away. So that's a common morpheme. And I'm going to just kind of give a few more here just so we can kind of see how these things break down. There are other morphemes in those words. I don't want to go into them now, but I just want to like let you know that there's, there's uh, more fun in, in each one of those words. Um, I'll give you a, an easy one here. Does anyone know that word? It's a trick question. It's not a word. But does, does anyone know this word? What is it? To walk. To walk. To walk, right? What about... Sipuete. To leave. And do we see the similarities there? H T E. Right. Long E. Yeah. No. No te has a long O. Oh, okay. Then it's to want. No te. Ito te. In this in this instance, it means to go there. And ote is to walk, so to walk there. Now this word has been used, it's kind of a commonly used word, and it, the meaning has shifted. Depending on the region, it can mean just to go in general, like neto tan minis tegok. Some people would say that, I go to the island. But technically it's made up of walk and kind of thus or to that place. Doesn't be so mean come here? But you've added a, a portion onto it, right? We've petote. That, that changes the direction. So that's on your sheet there too. Okay. There's, there's about 40 that have this morpheme on it. Oh, but, but what we notice here is if, if we learn that that one means walk, then we can link these words together as learners, right? Because we're starting from scratch. We don't have anything to remember. Um, oh, he's not in here. Okay, we'll wait for that example later. Um, Ramona, if I told you say sal has to do with exercise, what do you think that would mean? Um, say sal, oh, go and exercise? What does oh day mean? I can't remember. Oh, it means to walk. Oh, to walk. Uh, oh, so uh, walking for exercise? Something along those lines, right? Again, some, some of the, there's some regional differences in there, so we have to be aware of that. But, 
say salute, like Niggy say salutan. I, I walked for some exercise. I went for a little bit of a walk, something like along those lines. That's perfect. That's here. We're gonna go. We're, we're gonna actually. We'll just leave that one here. Write it over again. So. To jump ahead, pimpahta, what does that mean? To run. Run, right? Yeah. Now, what do we notice here? Pimote, pimpahta. Pim. They both show pim. So, what does pim mean? Well, the way we do, if we're a learner on our own, we have a dictionary. The way that I go about this, I start finding words with pim, and I look at the definitions, and I see. Is there anything similar in the definition? So if I can find something simple like walk and run and they both have it, that starts narrowing it down. Okay, so, so let's look at a few more examples. Um, yeah. So, se puede pata. So if I told you sipuete means to walk away, to leave walking, and I told you pahta means to run, what do you think sipue pahta means? Run to leave running, right? Yeah. To, to exit running. So again, as a fluent speaker, well, that's like, yeah, there's more than one word for things, right? Oh, depending on the situation. <laughs> Escape. Uh, tapasi, tapasi, flee. So you're just teasing somebody when you say tapasi. Tapasi is the very new year you say tapasi. Okay. Right, we have more than, we just use all those English words, flee, run, escape. Well, there's several different words to mean that kind of action. Okay. They all kind of have a little different meaning. But if you came up against sipue pata and you knew pimpata and you knew sipue te, as a learner, you can fill in the blank, right? I mean, you might not get right on and there's lots that'll trip you up. But if you do get it right, then it's like a freebie, right? It gives you a map of how to, how to kind of break these things down. Um, papa me pata. If I told you papa me means kind of like hurriedly or quickly or hastily, what would papa me pata mean? Or all over the place? Kind of, yeah, run frantically, or we talked about that. Kind of like run in a circle sort of thing. Kind of, and again, there's going to be a little bit of variance within region, and there's going to be a little bit of variance within speakers themselves, right? Some kind people. Like a rabbit running away from something? Would yeah, kind of. Papa me pata. Papa, would you say that? Wapus eki papa me patat? Something like that. So the rabbit like ran hastily around. But again, we see the pata, and we remember from that first presentation about all those contractions and the morpheme boundaries, what we're doing here is we're finding the morphemes. So sometimes they can disguise themselves. We're going to get to that in just a few more examples where the contraction takes place. Suddenly the morpheme doesn't seem um, to stand out as much, but the more we get used to seeing those contractions, like when I see a long AW and I know there's a break in the morphemes, or sorry, a long A, I'll sometimes expand that out and be like, oh, okay, I know that morpheme. And so it can kind of help. Uh, another way to, le to learn it, I guess, another way to remember. Um, so we put these parts together to mean meaning, but the parts can also help in uh, like grammatically wise. So, so we went pimote, we know that means to walk, right? There's something called a causative H, or that's what it's named in the books, and it causes things to happen. So, you know pimote, right? To walk. How would you say I walk? Pimotan. Pimotan, right? So I'm walking. And is there anyone else involved in that action? No. So it's one person. So in the books, we call that a VAI. But now I want to say that I cause you to walk, like I make you walk. Well, we can add this causative H to a lot of words. Now it's a VTA. So now once we've added this H, now we conjugate it like a VTA. So how would you say I see him or her? Niwapa Mao. So let's just take this example. 
Okay, WAPUM is your root in this. So this is a VTA root, and PIMUKTE with an H is a VTA root. So let's just take these other two pieces and put them on either end. PIMUKTE, how I caused him or her to walk. I made them walk. I made him walk. So we add that H in there. Sorry? Okay. So yeah, so the, it, it makes the first person cause the other person involved in the action. So, so that H is actually a morphing in itself. Now that doesn't mean every H in a word is the causative H. The causative H happens if, you, if you're reading a book and you get really good at your, if you get really familiar with your morphology, like how you change a verb to mean who's doing the action, then you'll know those ending pieces. And that H comes right before the ending pieces. So if there's an H there, most likely it's this H, and then the rest of the word you can find the meaning too. So if I know Pimote and I had an H, I got Pimote. So you get a freebie basically. Like you know walk, now you know cause to walk, right? And it doesn't work all the time, but, but when you're learning vocabulary, when you're reading, all of a sudden you're like, okay, I know like 90% of that word, what's the H mean? And when you figure out what the H means, you can kind of piece it all together. Or that's a technique I've found that's been helpful, right? The AW is still an ending that, that refers to someone. Maybe. Yeah, so, so what we have, we have two things going on here. One, in, I'm going to use the terms from the books, but again, use whatever terms make it stick in your brain. One is called inflectional, which means you inflect the verb to tell who's doing what. Mm -hmm. Okay? So this part is inflectional. You can change that, and it'll change who's causing the verb to happen, like nipimote how, or I could say nipimote hik, she or he caused me to walk. Mm -hmm. So those are changing who does the verb. The other thing we do is we find pieces within the root of the verb, and that's called primary der derivation, and it changes the word itself, the meaning. So when you have changes, and this is what I was doing there with when we got stuck on that, that word earlier today, because what was happening was, it was actually two different verb stems, like in the learner's mind. And I was sitting there being like, we were conjugating it under this paradigm, a VAI. Um, I can't remember what the word was. Uh, we, we chimos sim. win. Yeah, and then, but, but we also said, we we chimos sitan, right? And in that case, that verb was, was conjugating under this paradigm. That's why, and I, I, I'm really thankful for your patience. I was sitting there trying to figure out what type of verb it is, but really it was both. So that's why I didn't, I didn't see it coming. But anyway, so, so again, you can get stumped with this method as well, right? As you, <laughs> you were very patient with me as we kept trying to get all the forms we could figure out to get it. But, but also a lot of times this method will help clarify things as a learner, like this morning when we were doing the dictionary, um, once we know the four ways to change a verb, as soon as we look it up and the dictionary tells us what kind it is, you know how you can play with that verb, right? It gives you, it kind of, it gives you the cheat code, I guess. So just to give you a few more with this H. Does anyone know that word? Oh, tell a story. Tell a story, atchimo, right? So that's a imperative, we said, imperative. Mm -hmm. Tell a story. Achimo, tell a story. What does that mean? The causative H. Cause him or her to tell a story, right? Make him tell. Achimo, tell him, make him tell a story. And, and some of these forms are not always heard. They're more rare. Mm -hmm. Some of them are like almost purely grammatical. They're not very often said. Mm -hmm. So if you try a form out, and, and you're met with, like, the person doesn't understand it, don't be totally frightened. Sometimes, some things we just don't say in English either, like, um, I was readying myself, or, like, you know, there's some, some verb forms that just don't seem clear, because we don't use them at all. So, but, but you can try, Nitachimohao, or Nigiachimohao. Nigiachimohao. I made him or her tell a story. So here again, we have a word we already know, 
and we added an H, it's a free second word, right? Mm -hmm. And as long as we learn that second type of changing the verb, depending on who's involved, mm -hmm. then we get basically a whole other way we can but use the word. When we add the H, it becomes a VTA. Okay. When, without the H, it's a VAI. Now these terms, again, these are just grammatical terms for learners, right? It's, all these tell me is that w once I memorize the endings and the beginnings, all this tells me, I don't even think of animate and transit. All it tells me is those are the, the pieces I can use to attach to the side of it. This one, it just tells me I can, there's a whole bunch more pieces I can use once, once they become kind of more second nature, right? And, and if, you're, if you're speaking with fluent speakers, don't expect them to be able to break words like this up. That's, this is like a purely a learner's thing. It's, it's not, and it's not easy to do. Like if I was talking to you and I, I said, uh, um, I went to the institution and you said, what's an institution? What are the morphemes for that? Uh, you know, like, I don't know. There's shun in there, there's institute, but that's probably two morphemes. And then there's the, an extra A-T-E that's collapsed in there. I, I don't know, because as a fluent speaker in English, I got that for free, right? Like I just learned that growing up. But if I was learning English and I learned institute and I can put institution to it, it's like a kind of a way to learn it, right? It's not the only way, it's just our way, right? Uh, does anyone know this way, word? Speak square. How would you say that institution? Institution? Oh, how would I translate it? I don't know, I'd have to think on that one. Institution is a school. It could be, yeah. Right. Could do that, yeah. That'd be one way, for sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that would be one way to do it, for sure. Yeah. And that and translation as a whole, like, it's so, we were talking about that earlier, it can be very subjective based on who's listening and translating, right? I mean, I'm sure if we sat down long enough, we could find another way to use institution that you probably wouldn't want to use the word school for. But... At the same time, in certain contexts, that would totally work. The translation is a whole new area. I don't, well, I'm not really skilled in it, but also it's, uh, it's kind of a whole new ballgame. I don't think I want to dive down that hole right now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, for sure, that's one way you could do it. It would depend on, on the context. Um, Pikisque. So that means to speak. Okay. What does that mean? Yeah, make him or her speak. Now, and the other thing, sometimes words, as they change, they change meaning slightly. They have more specific meanings. So we have to be aware of that. And that's where, when we can learn the words and we can learn these tricks, then when you go to a fluent speaker, they're like, oh, well, that doesn't exactly mean this. It means this. And then you ask another fluent speaker and said, yeah, it, you know, it's like the, what did you use for divorce there? Weipen, weipen gay. Weipen gay win. Yeah, so that would be like thing of throwing things away but it has a very specific, specific meaning, right? So we have to be aware of that as well. Um, so yeah, we could add the same ending here. The Pika Squay How. I made him or her speak. Does that sound good to you guys? Um, so that's a really good one. I like the H. I remember when the first day I found that out, it was like kind of an aha moment. Doesn't work for everything, but when you see it, it's just there for you to, you know, if you want to take it or leave it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll leave that for you, Solomon. You, you, can, you can give. <laughs> um, so we talked about the contraction. I want to just show you a few more. And I showed, uh, I think we talked about this one today. Uh, so I'll, I'll give it a. So that says, like, call yourself, right, this way. And then I put that on, that means she or she, he calls herself, right? Oh, I don't think so. Should be the same. So this is broken into... That, oh, that's, I, I, that's inflection, meaning I call myself. So 
nitsika so and I call myself. And then, but if we break the root isika so up into its morphemes, we get isi, yikau, and iso. Those are the boundaries. And what do we notice here? AW plus an I. And if we remember our first lecture, anything at the boundary, AW plus an I is going to give you a long A. And the reason we do that was because of the stress pattern, right? Because we say nitsikason. We don't say nitsikason or something like that or nitsikason. It just kind of sounds a bit bizarre, right? Mm -hmm. So the reason I wanted to show you this is because sometimes the morphemes aren't always apparent, right? In this one, you have aso, a, long aso. You're, that doesn't look anything like iso, which is another morpheme, the meaning I do it to myself, like, or I'm the one involved in the action. It, this one's a grammatical function. It's a little bit harder to pin down. Um, yeah. Aso is the contraction of aw plus iso. No, that what I'm showing here is just that, yeah, it's, okay. but you'll get used to seeing these two. Um, ISO also sometimes just shows up as O. So we used uh, Pimote to walk, H, cause him or her to walk. The O from ISO, I do it to myself. Pimote ho is to travel. I cause myself to walk. That kind of so when we learn these pieces, the the I travel is a little bit different than I cause myself to walk, right? But we get another meaning by using the same stem, right? We we uh, we can expand the meanings of words by doing this. Now I want to give an example that uh, Myrtle used today at uh, at breakfast. And again, you were very patient with me as I tried to figure out all the different pieces. But you said this is going to be in uh, th. Again. Ah, it's too long. Just a second. E. He said, "Ina pakai ina pakai pakai api uin na." Okay, at first I was like, it, it was kind of like deer in the headlights, like, and then, okay, I heard Pachkoisigan in there, and I heard Apeo, which I'm not, I'll put that for later. Napake Pachkoisigan, okay, Napake, something flat, a Napake Pachkoisigan, something flat bread, pancakes, and then we know the word nap, this is Y again, but in TH it would be Napio. We know that word, right? Sometimes, sometimes, morphemes in the middle of the word just lose certain letters. So if you see that in a word, sometimes it can mean man. Because the N of Pachkwesigan and the N of Napeo kind of like hung out together, I guess. So we have flat, bread, man. This morpheme means to be in certain cases, which we have right here. And yin means you. So what she said is, flat bread man be you question. But when, I know it seems bizarre to break it up like this, but, but if we start with nothing, this can give us some handholds to kind of get along, um, along on the road. And so when you know napake pakkoisagan is pancakes, then she's asking, are you, are you a pancake type man or a pancake man? I mean, it was a joke, right? It was, it was like, it's not like this is like a dictionary word or whatever. But at the same time, it's fun, right? Like, like what did she say? You know, that was like 25 syllables. But at the same time, it's kind of a game, right? And, and Ramona, when we were studying those flashcards in the, in the car, remember how we were looking at them and they had some of the similar pieces? This is what, what I was trying to get at that if we can learn the pieces, then the next word is just a few more syllables instead of every word being 20 syllables long. 
Um, so yeah, it's just a kind of another way of learning the math instead of memorizing the math, I guess, is another way to put it. Um, I do want to point out, so, so another thing to kind of complement the other presentation, this method only works for learners if things are spelt consistently. Um, because yeah, if things are not spelled consistently, there, there's no way to do this because this relies 100% on being able to recognize visual patterns and then eventually turning those into audible patterns which is a long process, but it's possible. And then, but if, if I spelt this, you know, with long eyes in different places and stuff, all of a sudden I can't figure out what the morphemes are because it has to match the other words that have that same morpheme. Now that gets, a, this is an example of inflectional change, but it shows the process. So, in I sit. Apo, she or he sits. Why is it spelled like this when I say apo? This is a common question. It's because ape is the morpheme for sit. And all that's happening here is our mouth is making a W shape before we say the I. Apo, apu, apo. It's called like pre vowel, I think they call it pre vowel rounding. But all it means is our mouth is so quickly going into the W. It's going in right here. So the W and the I are combining to give us that O. And if we look at our contractions, it's the other way around. But if it's W plus I, it becomes O. The reason we keep it this way is because we want to be able to read a P as sit. Because if we read, if we spell it like that, this part of the word doesn't look like this part of the word. And then as readers and learners, we can't link those two. Plus, there's other words like Ah, po. Which is here. Uh, yeah, it's in particle. It changes depending on the context. But, but I have to just say, I agree with you, but there is no, there's some consistency in standardization and spelling, but there isn't uh, all, uh, all the time, like a lot of all the time. We did here, we first say that. I think, I thought. Uh -huh. You just asked the fluent speaker how they would say that in first person. Okay. Right? If they say, Okay. Then a fluent person would have an I get a return. Okay. That's, that's the e. But let's say no fluent person you're on and I'm reading mm -hmm. two different texts yeah. uh, if, that are, are but inconsistent in, in, in the their spelling. Then they're, like they're not in SRO. And, and you know for a fact that I'm talking about how a lot of stuff is. Yeah. You're not following right. that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and especially if it's going to continue by moving to CMRO. So I'm feeling just a little frustrated, yeah, and there's yeah. nothing that you can answer, but you're telling me to look for that up there because then I know it has to do with sit, but yet sometimes it'll be a full. Mm -hmm. Well, not because some, it some, people will, a some people will spell it as that full. Yeah, that's right. Know, because they, they don't know the rules. That's right. They don't know how to test that's the rules. That's right. So it'll be frustrating. Be frustrating. frustrating. What, what I can tell you as a light at the end of the tunnel oh. is again, we're going to do a bit of a presentation on TH to Y. CMRO is only being accepted in this, well, being contemplated for this region, right? Accepted right here. But SRO is used still. So if you learn how to convert, you can still write in SRO. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of political. I I'm just showing but I what... I also contextualize it to be able to get the meaning as well. Like looking around the, the, what it says to help to make sure in case I was confused that if it was APO instead of API billing. Yeah, but it puts more stress on your brain because you have to read the entire right. sentence and then uh, figure it out. I know, yeah. But uh, but with but I'm I'm just showing you kind of the perks of SRO because we were going to have kind of we had a basic SRO and this is kind of more advanced. I'll, I'll show you a good example actually we came across just today, and uh, this one. Does anyone know this word? It's wind, windy, right? You know, sorry, that, so that would be thought in, 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 in TH, right? Okay, we're going to put this in the conjunct, and we're going to get... Uh, okay? I was in the kitchen this morning, and I was asking, how would I say the water is boiling? 
And one way to say the water is boiling is Iohtik. Iohtik? Iohtik. Iohtik. But in rapid speech, you might not hear that difference. If I write Iohtik, Iohtik. Okay, so I'm reading a book, and someone says, Iohtik. Contextually, based on the chapter, I might be able to figure it out, or I might not. But if it's spelt this way, I can tell you for sure. It means it's windy. And if it's spelt this way, I can tell you for sure. It means it's boiling. Maybe they're sitting around the campfire and says, oh, Iohtik, Iohtik. Right? So again, that's kind of the bonus of this for readers, right? Because we don't always have the whole context. Like, I don't know what's happening in the scene in the book, but maybe they just walked up and all of a sudden the guy says, Yidotik. Right? So again, those sound very similar. And a lot of people would probably spell them the same. But every letter in there is telling me something because the root of the, of the first word is... And the root of the second word is that. And when you get used to the beginning and the endings, you stop seeing them as much. Like you read them, but you're focusing more on the middle part, right? You're, it's same with listening. You're focusing on the middle part because I heard yin at the end, so I just forgot about it until I can figure out what the first, the middle of the word means, and then I just add it in afterwards, right? Again, fluent speakers don't have to do this. I, I'm not thinking about every word that I'm telling you right now. I'm just communicating the way I normally communicate, right? But as learners, this can give us kind of a handle. So, um, is that enough, or do you guys want to see some more morphemes? You want to see some more? You're done? Generally wants to see more. Okay, we'll do a few more here. Achimo. Why don't you move over a little bit? Achimo. We can add stal. Stal. So we had achimo, right? That means to tell a story. We have achimo. Make him or her, cause him or her to tell a story. Now we have achimo stal. Stau means to do something for the benefit of someone. So we've heard achimo stauin, tell me a story. So achimo by itself, VAI paradigm, we follow those, those patterns in the book. Achimo stau turns it into a VTA paradigm, telling a story to someone. So, I tell him or her a story. That's different than saying netachimun, that just means I'm telling a story in general. But uh, I tell him or her a story like, for, so they can hear it, benefit them, right? Um, here's an interesting one. We learned that ISO means something to do with doing it back to me. Well, let's add that one in right here. And we get... And we have a contraction there. I'm just highlighting it. Um, so we get... That contracts down to achimustaso. So I tell a story for the benefit back to myself, someone who talks to themselves. Netachimustason. Is that is that what it means up here too? Netachimustason. Ekiachimustasoyan. Epimenawasoyan. Like I was talking to myself as I was cooking. Okay. So. So what we have here is we have achimo, we have stau, and we have ISO, and these ones are contracting. And again, why do we write that contraction but not other contractions? It's because the stress is here. Achimo so. Does that sound right? Achimo so. Does that sound right to you guys? I wouldn't say achimo so. Does, it doesn't sound right, right? So we want to put the stress there. That's why we write this contraction. So, the, so it kind of it maintains that stress pattern. Um, here's another one. Instead of ISO, which means it comes back on me, 
If you have plural people doing the action, you can use ITO, and it means they do it to each other. So we take achimo style and we add ito and we get we do that contraction so that aw plus i is going to be a long a achimo stato e achimo stato tick they told stories to each other so the ito when you have more than one subject doing it makes it go back and forth and if you're wondering how to conjugate these things if you add iso or ito on you go back to the vai paradigm this sounds like a lot. Again, it's on video. We can watch it several times to get the little pieces, right? I just want to expose you to these ideas because I've found it really helpful in learning that, that once you know ITO, you can, you, if you see a word with ITO in it, you're like, oh, okay, that means they're doing it to each other. But I want to show you one, <laughs> one exception. <laughs> it's, a it's, a tough, it's a tough class to sell with you here in the crowd there, Solomon. <laughs> I know. <laughs> a chimowin. Okay, so there's an, there's another morpheme. Let's talk about that one. A chimowin. We know achimo is one morpheme, right? It's actually more, but we're not going to get into that. Win. It me it makes something a noun. It makes it a thing. So achimo is to tell a story. We add win on the end. Now we have a story, like a story, the thing, a story. Like a, book? a book would be masnahigan, but same idea. Like if I tell you a story, like the physical noun of a story, whereas before that was a verb. That's the action of telling a story. This is the thing. This is a story, like the thing, a story. Does that make sense? A toske, okay. Atoske is, okay, Solomo, Solomo, asko, atoske, atoske, that means like go work, right? Nitao atoske, go work, that's a verb. But atoske win is like a job, it's a thing, right? So win makes a thing. Oh, let's, let's do that one, that's another good one. So tehtapo, notice that the IW at the end because we have the morpheme to sit in here. Taste means on top. And W is she or he is doing it. So she or he is sitting on top. That meaning has shifted to, in some places, to she or he is riding a horse. Because you sit on top of a horse. So we can see how those meanings shift slightly. But it's not really that hard to understand. Taste up, oh, okay, she's riding a horse. You know? But instead of the W, we add win. Now we have a thing. Sitting on top of thing, what do you think that could mean? Tehtapun, yeah, chair. So when we learn the pieces, tehtapun is made up of three morphemes. Does that make sense? Sort of? Clear as mud? Again, we got it on tape so we can read it, watch it over again. I'm pretty sure you all have my cell phone number. So. Um, I wanted to show you... I find this stuff really neat too, because every time you learn more words, you can add, it, it adds, like, to get the ball rolling on this is hard. Once you have 100 words, you start seeing more and more, and it becomes easier and easier. So, like, you know, the learning curve is like that, because you, you pick it up way faster. You see fluent speakers, and they're just going straight up, like, because they, you know, once you know 100 morphemes, you just have to know where you can put them to make what words. Sorry, what was your question? Okay. I'm wondering how do you, how do you like, start? Pick, yeah, how do you start? Like, how do you get to know what's cute or not? It's not like you can pick up that long word about being a pancake man, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> and break it down. But for me, I, I can't see those breakdowns. Right. Right? But I can see it because now you're pointing it out. Mm -hmm. But for me, where do I start in order to get to that level? First thing I would re recommend, do Solomon's book. Just do the whole thing. Get it done. The reason for that is you're going to know your endings and your beginnings. I have your book. I should have brought it and got you to sign it. <laughs> so if you finish his book, you'll know all the endings. 
That's the first step. Because the first step, you're, you're, it's called matching a hewe when it's on your sheet. I wrote the title down. The first thing you have, match it. Match in a hewe is to speak Cree badly. Yeah. No, match in a hewe. Match in a hewe. But you have your verb, right, Ramona? That's, that's, the verb is already in its preset form. When you add your pieces to the beginning and the end for who's doing it, that's called inflection. Solomon Books teaches you all the inflection. And that's the first step. The second, this is the second step of primary. So, so first you want to learn how to say everyone's doing something to someone else or what, whatever. You want to be able to talk about who's involved in the action. Then you want to memorize vocabulary. And voca well, ideally you want to do them at the same time, but you know. If you're going to focus on one thing, I would say this. Yeah, go for it. If you have a dictionary, the Nehe would do enough. Yeah. Eric Wilson Gray's dictionary. Yeah, if you read the introduction to that particular dictionary, it will help you with what he's talking about. Okay. Yeah, so just to clarify, so that comes on the microphone. If you have the Cree Words Dictionary. Sorry. A lot of people don't read the introduction to the textbook. Yeah, I know. I, I went for a lot of months till I figured that one out too. And it's well put. I mean, that's a very good teacher that came up with that book. There's something else I want to bring up since we're talking about that dictionary. We're talking about learning the pieces of who's doing the action, right, Ramona? Yes. So we have a verb. And if you do Solomon's book, you'll learn the ends of the verb, right? Mm -hmm. If you look up a verb in that dictionary, every verb ends in that. Always within the, is it the Well, end? sorry, there's a few exceptions, but they all end in the third person singular form. Okay. Okay. And this is all explained in the introduction, but I just want to show you. We, we ran into this in story time this morning when we were writing the story. If you don't know this, it's really hard to use that dictionary. Because if I look up, a, if I'm using the app and I look up a word, mm -hmm. I don't, so I want to I wanna look up the word for hear someone. I don't look up the word hear. And I don't look up the word heard. I look up the word hears. Mm -hmm. Because That's she or he hears someone. Mm -hmm. So we want to look up hears. The third person singular form in English. Because it will come up with the entry. Now with that app, I'll just recommend for learning, since we're talking about keeping these pieces spelled consistently, use that dictionary when you're starting out. Exactly. The other ones have lots of other words that you can eventually use, but that one keeps these forms the same. So for when we're right learning out fresh, it's, very, it's totally standard. Yeah, it's, it's like math. It's awesome. Um, but so we look up here, and if you... Math is awesome. Well, yeah. Anyway... <clears throat> but if we want a VAI, most times it won't have anything. If we want a VTI, it'll usually have S period, T period, something in the English definition. And if we want a VTA, it'll have S period, O period. This stands for something and that stands for someone. So if I want to say I hear him or her and I want the VTA, I look up the word hears something or someone. S period, O period. That will give me the VTA form. These are just tricks I learned after using it long enough, but it really does speed things up when you're looking through the dictionary and you see, he sees, he sees something, he sees someone. And I want to say, I see him, then I have to use the he sees someone. So I look up the word sees and I look for the definition that has S period, O period, because that tells me that it's the verb meaning to see someone. That kind of makes sense? Oh, yeah. That's actually really helpful. Awesome. Yeah, so, but those only work within that dictionary. The other ones don't follow that same pattern. So oh. as, I, as I say, when you're starting out, if you use that dictionary, for, this is my own opinion. It, I found it a lot more helpful just because it's, uh, it's spelled consistently. Okay. But the morphemes are spelled consistently. Okay, and one more quick example.
Yeah. Okay. One more example of breaking morphemes up. Does, does anyone know these two words? I am Ohtoak, I am Ihtoak. I am Ohtoak is, is the, uh, now you've got me second guessing myself. <laughs> this is they gossip about each other, and this one's they make it hard for one, each other, one another. They gossip about one another. And, and they, there you go. I am Ituak, they make it difficult for one another, right? I think that's enough. I think. Yeah. Hey, what's up, guys? Oh, I'm I'm going to I don't find it at all because, like, when we talk about we, uh, it, it doesn't specify gender. So, uh, if I've said, if I've used male dominance as my examples, it's just out of my own English brain that I've done that. Like, anything that I've said, like, he speaks could mean she speaks. It's the same, I would say. Is that what you mean to ask? Or have I misunderstood? No, that's the, uh, what I wanted to ask. Yeah. No, uh, th for sure. A lot of people have, have covered this. That's why I haven't gone into it. A lot of people have done uh, presentations on how we uh, is non-gender specific. You say you squeet. Yeah. What about it? Okay. So if I said ana 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 uh, ana squeal a pika squeet? You put a you put a, a noun in it. Yeah. You identify male or female. Okay. But if you just say pika squeet, pika squeet. Yeah. I think it, that would kind of depend on the context of the conversation, right? Because if I if you and I had been talking about Christine and I said, yeah, hey, pika squeet, Mr. He, with Agusik, like she spoke a lot last night, we would know I was talking about her, right? It kind of would depend on who's involved in the in the sentence I, uh, to my understanding mr yeah mr he squeak yeah she's always speaking a lot no i'm just kidding yeah okay awesome so that's good enough for everyone for now i think we're all brain tired if you do shoot okay So the question here is to write, do you speak Cree? <laughs> do you want it in Y or TH? Okay. Can you hear Wansi? Since we're on this and we've been talking about the dictionary, if you have the hard copy of that dictionary, like the book, not the app, anytime you see a Y with a tick above it, it changes to a TH. So if you're transcribing from oh, Y to TH, no, the, the, Y with the, yeah, the Y with the little tick means that it's a dialectal Y. But if it doesn't have the tick, it means it doesn't change in any dialects. Because even within TH and within N dialect, they have a Y, right? I marked all those Y's. <laughs> wow. So Solomon knows where all the Y's are. <laughs> Do you want any any other sentences while we're while we're at? So if you were on your own and you were trying to figure it out, 
First, we have to do vowel quality, right? We have to know that that's ki and that's ne. And these are just some tricks to learn on your own. What we can do, first of all, is those videos I've been posting with the stories with the, the subtitles. I know I see, I, I look like you're trying to but you know what I wish? You put the English at the bottom. Yeah, so. That kind of children. Well, the no. point, the, the English is actually, if you watch the whole video, the I English know. is at the end. But The reason you know I, I know what you're saying. The reason I didn't do that is because our brains will automatically read the English. It's as simple as that. Yeah, if it's there, you'll ignore the Cree completely, you though. But what we can do is when we figure out these pieces, we can take the word from the screen, write it down, break it up, and look it up in the dictionary. Some of those videos took me 14 hours to transcribe because I don't know the words. And I had to do this based on sound. Yeah, the, the hardest part is starting. But once you get going... Well, you, can, you can subtitle if you want. I'll give you the files. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> but uh, what was your... Oh yeah, to study on your own. If you didn't know how to pronounce this, first we learned the vowel qualities, right? What I was going to say is, if you watch those videos, your brain will, will subconsciously link the sound you hear to what you read. It's like a cheap way of learning, like a cheating way of learning to read. So my, my hope is after this camp, I can put out a whole bunch more of those videos. And so we can learn how to say Kinehewan, all those different vowel qualities, just by listening and reading. But it's fun, right? It's a video. It's, it's like candy. After that, we know we have to go back three to hit the stress. So that tells us where we put the stress. Then it's just a matter of practice. So with those two things, you can say any word. If you know where to put the stress and you know the vowel quality, you're good to go. So if we can watch those videos and remember our rules to find the stress, you don't need audio. It's kind of neat, eh? Because all of a sudden, all those books are useful. That's the plan anyway. <laughs> can you hear on see? Oh, they're on, they're on YouTube. Yeah, if, if you just search up the name of this camp, or Cree Storytelling Camp, or Solomon Rat, I think I tagged all those things, so. Oh. Hey,